during the dread reign of the cholera in New York. I had accepted the invitation of a relative to stay with him in his cottage or knee on the banks of the Hudson in an attempt to escape the deadly virus. We had all the ordinary means of amusement and should have passed the time pleasantly enough before the fearful intelligence that reaches every morning from the city. The drying of your tears Today we escape Not a day elapsed that did not bring us news of the death we of some acquaintance. Escape. As the fatality increased, we learned to expect the daily loss of some friend. Before your father hears us before oh, At length, we tremble at the approach of every messenger That palsy and thought, indeed Took entire possession of my soul. I could neither speak, think, nor dream of anything else. My host was of a less excitable temperament. His bitch philosophical intellect was not affected by non realities. His substance of terror he was sufficiently alive, but of its shadows. He had no apprehension. His endeavors to arouse me from the abnormal gloom into which I had fallen were frustrated in great measure by certain volumes which I had found in his library. The contents of these volumes forced into development whatever seeds of hereditary superstition were latent in my bosom. I had been reading these books without his knowledge, and thus he was often at question due to the impression which had been made upon my fancy. This place is a prison. These people aren't your friends. A favorite topic with me was the popular belief in omens, and the subject we had long and animated discussions regarding our different views. And flooded again and again. The fact is that, soon after my arrival, there had occurred to myself an incident so entirely inexplicable that it might well have been regarded as an omen. It began on an exceedingly warm day. I was sitting, book in hand, at an open window that overlooked a distant hill and a portion of trees. My thoughts had been wandering from the volume, and as I lifted my eyes from the page, they fell upon the naked face of some living monster of hideous conformation, making its way from the summit to the forest below. As the creature came into sight, I began doubting my sanity wondering whether it was real or just in a dream. The size of the creature, by comparison with the trees, was far larger than any ship that lined in existence. The mouth of the animal situated at the extremity of a 70-foot proboscis, projecting from the root of this trunk being two gleaming tusks, and from the back outspread two pairs of wings, nearly 100 yards in length, and thickly covered in metallic scales. But the chief peculiarity of this horrible thing was a representation of Death's head, which covered the whole surface of the breast, filling me with a sense of horror and a sentiment of forthcoming evil. For two full days after the incident, my first impulse was to inform my friend of what I had seen and heard, but I just couldn't. I can scarcely explain the force which had prevented me to tell him. A little while later, we were sitting in the same room in which I had the vision of the monster. I was occupying the same seat at the same window, and he was lounging in a chair nearby. Being in the same place at the same time, I felt the urge to tell him of my vision. He listened all to the end, laughing heartily, but not believing a word I said. At this moment, I again saw the monster, and with a scream of terror, I got his attention. He looked for it eagerly, but still said he saw nothing. 
even though I showed him the course of the creature moving down the hill. I was deeply disturbed, for I considered the vision either as an omen of my death, or worse, an attack of mania. I sat back in my chair, and for some moments buried my face in my hands. When I uncovered my eyes, the vision was no longer apparent. My host resumed calmness, and questioned me on the vision of the monster. When I was done, he sighed deeply, as if relieved of an intolerable burden. Here, let me sit down. Without your description of the monster, I may never have been able to find it. Here, a schoolboy account of the genus Sphinx, class of Insecta or Insects. The account runs thus. Form membrane-like, wings covered with scales with metallic appearance. Mouth forming a rolled proboscis, upon the sides of which are found the rudiments of mandibles. Then fear wings retained to the superior by a stiff hair, antenna in the form of a club, prismatic. The death's headed sphinx has occasioned much terror among the vulgar by the melancholy kind of a cry it utters and the insignia of death it wears upon its coarse leg. Ah, here it is. Quite remarkable, but not still as big as you say. I find it to be a sixteenth of an inch in its extreme length, and a sixteenth of an inch from the pupil of my eye. 